Well, welcome everyone. My name is Earl Beatty. I'm a senior fellow here at Constructs. And I'd like to talk to you today and share some insights about how you can move from regulated waterfall software development to regulated agile software development. And I think those take some gestalt shifts. And for those who may not be familiar with what a gestalt shift is, a gestalt shift basically looks at the same reality but sees it in a whole different way. An example here is like the image on your screen right now of this vase down here. And that vase basically says, do you see two faces or do you see a vase? And you really can't see both of them very well at the same time. It's that your mind will jump from one to the other. And that's the kind of thing I'm thinking about as we look at gestalt shifts in software development from regulated to waterfall to regulated agile. We're going to see those regulations the same way. They're the same regulation, the same reality. The question is, can we just shift our perception enough that we could see how to do regulated agile with them? Because we've already kind of figured out how to do, in a sense, how to do regulated waterfall with them. Now, we're not going to pick on any particular regulations. There's lots of kinds of regulated out software out there. So I'm going to be talking in a very general sense about regulation. There are potentially regulations that say you must do this particular thing, and I'm not arguing that you, you don't do that. But we're just saying that in general, can we start seeing how we could be more agile on regulated projects when the world seems to be telling us waterfall? But before we get in that, a little bit of housekeeping to get going here. Uh, this is part of the Constructs Lunch and Learn series. And we're hearing a lot of good things from you because we, we did something like this back in 2009 during the Great Recession where things were really rough for a lot of software engineers and we wanted to give them something so they can build up their skills that they could have more to take to the marketplace. So we started our SPEAR program back then to help them grow in their abilities. And we sort of want to do that during this time of coronavirus. As you can see, I'm coming from my house here too. Because what we want to do is create a community of people that said, yes, I'm still part of a larger, even though I'm working from my home or I'm not, unfortunately, maybe even working right now, I'm still part of this larger community who can get together and learn and grow and increase the uh, skill. And we've been hearing from you because you said this stuff is great. And so we were actually going to continue this in some form going forward. Uh, we may change the names like that, but we're going to keep coming to you during this time of quarantine so that you can have the skills necessary to really go forward with this. So continue to share these with your friends. Tell them about them. Tell them they're coming. We're happy to have you here. A little bit about the technology we're using. We're using Microsoft Teams Live Events. Um, in this technology, there's a couple things you should know. Up near the top, you'll find this a little uh, button that looks something like this thing right here. Um, and that is it's not yellow, but it's I think it's black background and white background, depending on your settings. But the idea is that you can click on that and there's a place to submit questions. And I encourage you to submit them throughout the entire uh, talk because I'm going to be about 30 seconds or so ahead of you. And so if you wait to the last minute, I may not see that question at the end. I'm actually joined by Eric and Jesse. They're going to be watching these things. And if they can answer your question almost immediately, they won't even wait to the end. So you can get your questions answered a lot faster. So take advantage of Eric and Jesse. They're out there to help you use the question button. The other thing you could do with Microsoft Live Events, which is kind of cool, is that you can pause it. Anytime that you need to step out for a second, you can pause it and come right back to it. It does mean I get a little bit further ahead of you because I'm not going to pause but you can pause. And if you're using the web interface, be a little careful though, because when you hit the space bar, that's one of the controls that will pause the presentation. So if you see things look kind of frozen to you, check to make sure that you've not paused it accidentally. And because you can pause it, you can also scrub back and play back something you just heard and thought, I wanna hear that again. You can scrub back and then catch up when you want to. So the technology is kind of flexible, but the main thing I want you to take away from this is that you can pause it and that you can submit questions at any time. And I encourage you to submit them as we're going forward here. So what's our lunch courses for today? Here's what I think we're going to do. We're going to start out with a little bit. I'm going to list out these seven, what I think are seven gestalt shifts. Now, they may not be all the shifts that you need to make. Uh, and maybe this might be one that you don't need to make personally at all because you've already made that shift. That's perfectly fine. But this is to give you the idea of the kinds of things we have to shift through from going from thinking just in pure waterfall because that's what the regulation says to how do we actually want to capture evidence, right? And that's what the seventh one sort of talks about. And all this, I'll wrap this all up as we digest our lunch courses 
at the end of this talk. And I'm thinking this is going to go about 40 minutes. We'll see what goes down here. So let's start looking at our Gestalt shift number one. And again, the Gestalt shift is looking at that reality, the same basic reality, but seeing it slightly different. And the idea is say, do we really see water to fall development in our regulations? And can we make a Gestalt shift to intellectual phases? To start seeing what regulations are talking to us about is how we intellectually do it, not what we actually do. So what happens? Well, we get a regulation. In this case, I'm using the example, the IEC 62304. And this regulation is presented like this. In fact, I think this might be an image that's actually in the regulation. And it's presented like this, where there's a whole overall planning about how to do all these things. And they list all this work that has to get done. And they had to list it somehow. And where they chose to list it was a pretty compact, pretty easy to understand form where they have a bunch of boxes of equal size. And these equal size boxes are basically numbered. So you can reference them really quickly. They actually probably refer to paragraph numbers later on in the documentation so that you can get to it and understand what that box is trying to represent. And you'll look at these things and you yeah, this is work that needs to get done. And no one's going to argue that this is work that needs to get done. Somehow you have to do this work. And it makes logical sense to us. This makes sense. But when we start seeing these things, right, and we take our, our look and we start perceiving these things as sequential activities, then it's really easy to slide into this, right? Where we start seeing a regulation waterfall. And the entire presentation seems to encourage that, right? Because we got these sequential boxes of the same size. They look exactly like our presentations of the waterfall does if I just offset them a little bit here. And plus they're numbered sequentially, 5.2, 5.3, 5.4, 5.5, and so on. It looks like regulation waterfall, and that's what the regulation is telling you. So here's our first place that we may need to make a gestalt shift. Look at the same reality and see it differently. Because if you start looking at these things, you see that 5.2 in particular is talking about requirements kind of things we need to do to figure out what the problems are. And maybe even 5.3 a little bit, because what's our overall solution to this? And then 5.3 and forward is going to try to figure out a little bit about how we're going to solve it. And 5.5 is doing work, and 6, 5.6 and 5 is all about testing to make sure the work we did is correct. And then 5.8 is about giving it out to other people. And the way we can shift this to start saying, instead of seeing these as activities that are sequenced, see these as intellectual phases. That is, this is intellectually what has to go on in our heads to actually do this work. And I think you can kind of group this into three main areas that Grady Booch did years ago. Right. This is not a new thing. This has been around for a long time. And what you see that these three kinds of intellectual work we have to go through on all creative work, and they're named discovery, invention, and implementation. Let me give you a little sense what that's like. The example that I like to use, let's say that you have, that you go into a kitchen and your hands start preparing food. I don't think any of us have ever looked down at hands going, it's making food. I don't know what it's making, and I don't know why it's doing that, right? When we've walked into that kitchen, we've already sort of figured out, hey, I'm going there because I want a snack, or I'm going there because I need to make a meal for myself and my family. We have a reason for walking in there. That's discovery. Why am I bothering going to? What problem am I trying to solve? And once you try to solve it, these, or once you figure out what it is, for example, this last Saturday, I wanted to cook breakfast for my wife and two daughters. So the problem was I need to come up with a breakfast for my wife and two daughters. And then I had to figure out what am I going to do about that, right? That's the problem. It's breakfast time. I have a wife. I have two daughters. What am I going to make? Well, then I have to come up with a menu. And that's invention. What's the solution to this particular problem? You know, I could have chosen pancakes. I could have waffles. You know, broiled lobster, yeah, you could do that for breakfast, but that's usually not a common breakfast, and it might take too long. So it's doable, but it's not really the right solution for that particular problem. So you want to make sure that the invention actually solves the actual problem at hand. And then finally, implementation. So I chose waffles. Well, I have a recipe, invention. I got to make sure I time everything right. I have to schedule everything out, and I have to have the skills and expertise to actually do it, present it, put it on the table so everyone can eat. That's just cooking. It goes through three intellectual phases. Artwork, those three intellectual phases. What mood am I having? What kind of canvas or material do I want to represent that? And then actually have the skills to paint and draw. A very common process here. Now, software has this too. We typically call this requirements 
design, and code and test. But just like in my cooking, when we try to start somewhere later than discovery, if we try to start down over here somewhere, right, and just do implementation, we still have to make up a reason for this other thing. I know that some of us during this time of quarantine have gone to our kitchens, opened up the fridge, and we've told ourselves, I think I'm hungry. When we really weren't hungry, we were just bored. But we still had to guess what the reason was that we went in there so that we could have justified why we were there and what we were doing, not just wandering around. So all work has to go through these phases and it has to happen in this order, which makes it seem very waterfallish to begin with. But it doesn't have to be that way. Because one of the things we start seeing when we start seeing it from waterfall and start thinking about this as intellectual work that has to get done, we can start realize that these phases have a really bad habit of overlapping, especially the bigger we get. And what does this overlap mean? It means that while we're still trying to understand why we're doing this, right? Let's say going back to the cooking, while I'm still trying to figure out what meal am I actually trying to solve this for? Is this breakfast, lunch, dinner? How many, myself or others? I'm already coming up with a menu and I've already started cooking it, right? And what's the danger of that? What's the danger of this overlap that we see here? Well, the danger of this overlap, especially when we get down to this kind of overlap right down in here, the danger of this overlap is that as I am implementing it, I'm actually cooking some food, I realize this is the wrong food to be cooking. I've just created a bunch of waste. And we see this happening on projects all the time, especially when we have our waterfall regulated approach. This is where we try to do all the requirements up front, and then we get halfway through and we realize those were the wrong requirements, or we were missing massive requirements. And so it gets us in a lot of trouble. And so once we start making the shift to start seeing this work not as sequential activities, but as intellectual work, then we can bring new tools to the game. A tool like maybe we could figure out how to avoid some of this nasty overlap stuff down here and so we have lower risk overall, more effort producing actual valuable software as opposed to reworking things we blew up in the first place. So my first shift is start saying, let's start thinking things instead of thinking the regulations is telling us about waterfall, think about telling us as intellectual work that needs to get done and it's up to us to figure out how to arrange that intellectual work and we'll see some ideas of that in a little bit. And again, as you have questions or comments, you feel free to drop those in the Q&A and we'll answer those as we go forward. The second one here is a shift from features to consumable, valuable, small batches. What's well, a, a very fancy name. You might use the word stories here. Um, you might use the word uh, uh, PBIs, but the idea is that something that's valuable that I can build really small rather than entire features. Because most of us, when we're going to waterfall, think, feature thoughts. And the feature thoughts that we think tend to say, ah, for this whole release or this feature, I have to do all the discovery, then I do all the invention on this feature, and then I do all the implementation of this feature, and the feature's not done until the feature's done in all its glory. That's the idea. So whether this is on an entire release of your, your, of your uh, regulated software or just on the feature level of the regulated software, we still have this mentality that I have to understand the entire feature, have to design the entire feature, and then I have to actually then code and test the entire feature. And the feature cannot be used by anyone until it's all done. I was working with a medical device company uh, last year and they had a feature like this was all about measurement. And in this measurement feature, it was going to take 11 months to build all the possible ways this thing can measure things based upon the images that it was getting. And that's a long time. No one could actually do work that involved any kind of measurement until the measurement feature was done. And they were going to say it's going to take 11 months. That's what we get here. And what they were discovering was just like everything else. When we have these large batches, it really encourages that overlap. They were discovering along with everyone else that things they thought were true a month ago or two months ago or four months ago, and in this case, actually, a year previously is no longer true today. And so they were doing rework and have to re-architect and redesign and basically having attend lots and lots and lots of meetings because they're trying to figure out everything when they really didn't know yet. And so this is the large batch or the feature kind of approach. What if instead we started saying, what if we did little parts of features, small batches? This is the idea of small batches, is that instead of doing trying to do all the discovery, all the invention, all the invitation, we do a little bit of discovery, 
a little bit of invention and a little bit of implementation. And so that what we discovered is fully implemented by a small batch or in a short period of time. Now, this is a probably wonderful looking Nirvana right here, right? So it's like, yeah, could we do that? Is it possible? Well, that device company, one of the things I started working with is they say, you know, can we craft a small batch? What's one thing you want to do with a tool that they're building? This medical device. And they said, well, here's one particular thing we want to do with this medical device. And so I looked at the measurement team and said, how much of your feature would you have to build support that one little thing? And they said, well, we'd have to build this. And I said, okay, how long? They said, well, that's about three weeks. Oh, so in three weeks, we could do one tiny thread of act things that this whole machine, which could do a whole tapestry of stuff, but we could do one thread of this thing, one little pathway through this, which is three weeks worth of work. Well, that was something that we could start using and we start building upon. So this idea of switching from this idea of, I have to build the entire feature to I could build these small slices of features to put that I combine with other features to actually produce something of interesting value. Now, while this sounds like what Agile wants, this is not what I typically see. What I typically see is something more like this, that there is some amount of time up front where we maybe don't go as deep, you don't see it as deep as we had in the first picture, but it's as wide. We're looking at the breadth, but not the depth of the system. So we do some breadth and depth, and then we do some incremental small batches. And then there's still a period at the end that we have to do some validation. So if we sort of spell it out here, early on we see the problem analysis. Really, do I understand what the overall problem? Maybe I'd get some custom requirements. We build our personas. We also figure out overall system architecture and what the major features are and start building prototypes and start getting some feedback. Back. So we've done all three of those things, but we've done it broad and not deep. And then we go through a series of deep but not broad incremental development, where we create something that hopefully that someone could use and give us feedback on. Like that medical device company I was telling you about earlier, they could then take that and show that one thin thread of the tapestry, that one thread of the tapestry, and show it to someone and say, what do you think? Right? How's it working? Is it doing what you expected? Because that thread was there. It didn't do anything else. It just did that one thread and they get that feedback and they can then weave another thread in, weave another thread in, weave another thread. So they always knew exactly where they were at. But because this is a regulated device, we're certainly not want to go through trying to go through all the release activities again. So we're going to have a period at the end that's focused on the go to market, final validation, testing, regulatory filing, all that kind of stuff that you want to do only once on a big expensive project like this. So that's what I see this happening pretty consistently this way. It's more like this than the sort of agile nirvana, but still it's a shift from trying to build the entire feature all at once. Again, as you have questions, Q&A, go ahead and submit them as we keep going. The third gestalt shift is kind of start building on these other two shifts to start saying, how do I actually take in that regulation? Do I take that regulation as a template or as a framework. And what does those two words actually differently mean? Well, I'm gonna show you this the Gestalt shift because I think we have to make the shift in many areas of software development, not just our regular areas. We see this often in scaling problems as well, where people mistake a framework for a template. So what is a template here? Well, this is what happens, right? We go back to our overall thing. And we say, okay, this is what the regulation is telling us. And we see this picture or we see something equivalent to this and go, yep, that's what we have to do. And so we define our controls as if this was telling us how to do it. So we come up with our controls and we lay out our controls so they map wonderfully to what we think this has been telling us. We've used this as a template, right? And the template had these different things. And so we take our template and we start lining them up here. See how these all line up so wonderfully, right? There's clients clear ads. So we finish stage gate one, whatever we call stage gate one. We could say, okay, we want to see this amount of documents done because we had this activity up here. So we should see those done and we want those signed off and checked off and all the signatures are on there. And at the end of stage gate two, right, these should be done and should be signed off. So we treated the regulation as a template that we should match our controls and our processes against to go forward. And then along come and says, hey, we should be agile. And we put up our little agile thing down here and we go, ew, right? This isn't lining up at all, right? Our controls say, our stage gates or our, whatever controls we put in place say we have to have this done. But what do we do? This doesn't seem to match up at all. 
And this is because we treated the regulation as a template rather than a framework. Now, uh, what a framework is saying is that here's the kinds of things that have to happen in roughly an order, but you're free to adjust it slightly to match your needs, to match what you're doing. So what if instead of trying to take a template approach, we took a framework, we did that gestalt shift to a framework approach, we might see something like this. And again, this is stolen from uh, AAMI TIR 45 2012, right? This is one of their mappings, uh, which I even took some liberties redrawing. But you can start to say, we had a sort of template book, but we turned it and thought, hmm, if we treat that as a framework, we treat it as the things that need to get due, we can start saying, hey, I can start seeing this in a different format, the same reality, right? The same basic things being accomplished here. And so what this allows me to do is say, if I make this gestalt shift here and say from template to framework, I can rearrange the pieces so that when I go back and look at my agile thing and say, hey, this can start to make sense a little bit. I can do some of this initial planning up front, right? I can start laying out my big picture, my wide but not deep, right? And I can save some of my release stuffing for this over here, but I can start saying what I'm likely to do. And then I can take my increments and I can do my incremental planning, right? I'm just saying, here's my goal for the increment and how I'm going to make sure I can test and do integration testing at the end of that increment. And then for all the little pieces within that increment, I got this stuff here, right? Because now I'm seeing it as a framework rather than a template. And then I can match up my controls so it works really well. My controls can explain and say, here's how I've used this as a framework and I crafted controls that allow me to do the kind of development life cycle I want to do. So when you think about agile quality controls, right? Not just quality controls for anything, but if we're trying to think it from an agile gestalt shift here and start thinking from an agile perspective, we can start seeing these stage gates more as go, no, go decision points as opposed to document signing parties. Too often when I go into organizations that have good stage gates, and this I think is important, especially on large investments to have stage gates, because we want to be able to say, is this investment still making sense? Are we going the right direction? Do I have control over this? And too often it became what I call down here a document signing party. We were just checking off that documents were created, not that the overall investment was still making sense or not. And so one of the things we can do is start changing from a document signing party to the, hmm, is this still making financial sense? Do we need to adjust our goals? Do we need to make a, uh, an overall dif difference in our planning? Do we need to inspect and adapt? Right, so that's one way our controls. And if we do that, we should start being able to use evidence. Now we're building incrementally, we can use evidence generated by the process itself rather than relying on those documents. Because frankly, let's be honest, right? Those documents never gave us much evidence. We would have we signed off requirements documents, we'd have signed off design documents, and we would really never really know where the project really was at, right? But if we had building up existing software, these threads into the tapestry of our final product, we could have evidence generated by the thing itself, the sprint goals being met, demonstrations being done, actual verification and validation happening during the life of the project, right? We're actually passing tests as we go. And the other thing we could do here is start being more clearly intentional about what we're labeling things. One of the things I've noticed in many of the regulations I've had to encounter is that they said things, if you call it this, then you have to do that. Well, one of my favorite is if you call it a requirement, you have to treat it like a requirement, which means you're going to have to trace it. And you're going to have to show it passing in verification and validation because you called it a requirement. Now, what is a requirement? Well, I don't really tell you that. They just tell you that if you call it that, then you're stuck. And I've been with teams that have called 6,000 and 10,000 things a requirement, which means validation lasted a very long time. But I've been on other projects that's called a handful of things requirement, and validation was straightforward and actually more appropriate to what they were really trying to do. So when we start thinking about agile quality control, we start mirroring it up to those kinds of things, those framework kind of approach, we can make controls that are actually more intentional and better serve us overall. My fourth gestalt shift is switching from component to value path, or as I've been calling it, this thread of, of the tapestry that we can weave through it. Because how does this look? 
Well, most of the time when I show up at a regular to, at a company, they're doing what I call full component or full feature development. That as you look at this work queue over here, this work queue is full of features. Right? They just say, we're going to put work features on this work queue. And here's all the features we need to build. And they basically spin up one team per feature. Maybe a team will get two features, but typically one team per feature. So we have, you know, 200 people working on this thing because we have 15, 20 major features or feature or component areas, right? However you want to call it. And we're going to have to build the whole thing. And so we kick them off. The work queue is there and they can start doing their own little thing. But basically, we don't have any chance to get this thing together until the very end. So there's a wide distance between when we kick off work and we can actually get it integrated and test it together. That's full component work. And the Gestalt shift here says, maybe you don't need to do that. Maybe I can switch this and start see if I can shrink this up. And what I've done here, I've changed the work queue here to those what I call value paths. Value paths or these threads in the tapestry of building it says, you know what? I need something from 18 different features or in this case, three different components to actually work together so I can produce something that I can show to external clients, whether those clients are human or those clients are other systems that are making calls to my system, right? I can expose this now as a working thing. And what I have to do is I have to take that thing, which involves multiple different teams here, and start saying, okay, how do I allocate that up? So I have to add a little level of complexity here of allocation. So the previous one was kind of cool. I didn't have to think of that hard about how to allocate this all. I have a feature, I have a team. I have a component area, I have a team, duh. But what I have to do here is I do my, my, my gestalt shift is that I have to say, I have to think about, hmm, what parts do I need from different teams to actually create something useful? As I shared with you about that measurement team, right? When I went to them and said, how much do we need to build of this measurement to support these other parts that are all gonna come together to produce this one thread of actual value, thread that something we can show and expose to whatever consumer's using it. And he said, yeah, that's only gonna take a couple of weeks. And that's really awesome because now I can start getting that integration and user testing happening much, much, faster. I can get the feedback loops going much, much faster. And I can find defects way sooner than waiting to the very end of the project, which is going to save me lots of time and money. And so even though I may not actually go to market until I've got hundreds of these little threads done, I can start finding defects sooner and not wait till the very end where everything goes to heck in the handbasket. And one of the things I've really found fascinating is I've, what I've got organizations start doing this, they start saying, but Earl, what happens when I don't need a particular feature for a thread? Or I don't need that entire feature team for a thread. What do I do? And I said, you can let them be idle because my goal is not here to keep people busy. My goal is to produce valuable working software. I want to get something out for people so I can start using it and I can start building the product up. And sometimes, yeah, there might be a component team that's not necessarily busy. So what do you want to do with them? And I think there's lots of things you could do with those people. One, they can just work on, and now be careful here. I do not want them working on future things because it's speculative. Until I get the other teams lined up, they can just take guesses what the other team's going to do, and they're likely to guess wrong. We'll have the overlap problem again. But I can have them working on improving the work environment itself our build systems, our DevOps systems, our continuous integration, um, our tool set, all of those can be built up so that when they do have work and the other teams work, things are going better. There might be some emergency fixes in production systems that they can tend to. There could be um, uh, testing that they can be helping automate. They could even disperse slightly and go help other teams to get done quickly so they can get back to work on things they work on. But my goal is always throughput over activity. That's what's really important here. And that's what the shift takes us from, do I have all these teams and now I have enough staff to try to build all these features to how do I build my threads? And maybe I even flex my people a little bit, not a lot, because I still have deep specialties here, right? I'm in regulated software. There's very deep specialties here. So I'm not moving people around randomly. I'm not going there. But I am saying, hmm, let's not make them do speculative work. And let's take best advantage of whatever tools we have to get the throughput as high as possible. My fifth gestalt shift here is 
from requirements to decisions. And this one seems kind of weird because a lot of times, well, yeah, we have to have requirements and there's no doubt we have to have requirements. But as um, Eric, who's on the background here, answer your questions, you can start pinging him right now on your questions because Eric is an expert of requirements. And he and I both even hate using this word requirement anymore because it has become so meaningless. And so one of the ways that I've tried is to say, you know, it's better to think about these things as decisions because if you think about the common way we define requirement, the common way we use this word, right? The way we use this word is that it's just a decision that we impose on the implementation. The example I love to use, when my children were younger and they wanted to use my car, I'd say, yes, you can use it if you return it full of fuel. That is, I've made a decision on their implementation, their use of my vehicle. I've imposed this. If you want to use it, you have to return it full of fuel, right? And that's how we tend to use the word in every day. Someone's made a decision that, yes, when this is implemented, it has to do this or that. Because when you start using this common definition, rather than the official definitions, I will claim this is not an official definition, this is an oral definition. But if you use this definition, you can start doing some really cool things. You can start saying, gosh, what does it mean to do good requirements work? And you can start asking the good reporter questions. What the heck decision are we making right now, right? What are we deciding about? Because I think we're making decisions about lots of different things, and I wanna go on that here in a moment. And then I can start saying, okay, so we're making this decision. Is this the right person to be making this decision? I was working with a, a device company uh, that was only lightly regulated, and they had a person in the marketing department that was a brilliant UI designer and he could UI design with the best of them. So he was the right person to be making UI designs. But everyone else in the marketing department were horrible. But because this one guy did it, everyone else thought it was our job to do the UI design. And one of my coaching to them was get that one person out of marketing because he's misleading them. The rest of them were destroying their product, right? He was the right person to make UI design, but the rest of the people in the same role we're not the right people. So it's not about role, it's about who should be making the decision, who is the best skilled person to make the decision. And then we can make the question, wow, is this the right time to make this decision? Because I have found that if I'm trying to force decisions to be made before they need to be made, before the last responsible moment, if you will, if I'm trying to force those decisions earlier just because I can, right? what happens is usually we change our mind. We get new information and then I have to remake that decision and any work and other follow along decisions based upon that have to be revisited. So we can start asking these good questions. What are we trying to decide about? Who's the right person? And is this the right time? And I actually have a framework I like to use on this one. And I have two columns here that are really important. One is I think there's decisions about what problems we want to solve. Given that there's lots of problems out there in the world, what we're building is not gonna solve all of them. I'm working with one uh, regulated company right now who's saying we are only this subset of a larger set of problems. That's what our product is gonna focus on. In fact, they have different products for different kinds of needs because they're solving slightly different problems. But we have to be clear about what problem we're trying to solve. And of course, we have to have decisions about how we're gonna actually solve it. What are we gonna build to solve that problem? And I think these decisions have different levels of scoping to them. They have different scopes of the decision. My highest level scoping decision is sort of at the product level, right? The overall thing that we're building. We have to make decisions both at the problem and of the solution. For example, the problem might be something like a product vision or something like that. It says, okay, who is this for? What real problems are we trying to solve? And in the solution thing, we might be thinking about the architecture, the overall set of features that we might be looking at to help solve that problem. But these are things that affect the entire product. The scope of the decision impacts the entire product. Other than that is maybe we have decisions that only affect one release, right? That we're only doing this for the, we're moving this product in this direction. We want to be here with this product, but this release will only take us halfway. So here we might have things like berries and acceptance criteria. Now, berry here is an oral word. Um, Barry stands for beginning and reason for interaction. That's beginning and reason for interaction. You might think of this as a use case, very similar concept. Uh, a decent user story is going to be here in this category as well. But beginning and reason for interaction helps me understand that this is an interaction that someone's using with what I'm building that they find 
valuable because that's their reason for interacting it. And the acceptance criteria. How well do I have to do that to be say you've done it in an acceptable way? That's the problem we're trying to solve. And over on the other side, we might have a system design or release design overall that says, yes, at the release level, this is where I'm going to take it to get it halfway there. There might be stuff at the increment level. So we're not doing a whole release. We're doing one of those thin slice increment. Here I might be looking at a value path, one way to try to achieve that berry. For example, a berry might be withdraw money. Well, there's 20 different ways to withdraw money. So this increment is going to focus on this one thread of a way to draw money. I'm going to use, I'm going to get cash from checking using a teller, right? That's one thread perhaps. And what are all the features I'm going to have to build? Maybe I was talked about those up in system design, but here we're going to start talking about the one feature, which is going to be the ATM um, transactional code, right? Might be what we're going to build in this particular increment. And I might even have a work item level down to the very smallest level where I talk about the step, some details about that one step in that thread or the one point in that thread that going forward and some preferences and code down here. And so I have all these different levels or scopes of decision and I have them in two different basic columns over here. And that's really, really handy. And what's nice about this is that I can start talking about the difference between high level decisions or high level requirements and low level requirements. The difference between a high level requirement and a low level requirement is not how vague it is, though a lot of people like to try to claim that's true. The difference between a high level and a low level is the scope of the decision. How much impact is on that scope? And what's also cool here is I can say, how many decisions do I typically have at each of these scope levels? With a product level, I think I have just a few decisions. There's a handful of decisions there that need to be made to be made really well. At the release level, I think there are dozens of decisions, maybe in the 20, 40-ish kind of range. Increment level could be hundreds, two, three, four, 500 easily. But down the work item, I think there's literally thousands of decisions down here. And this is really important because the lower level decisions really rely on those upper level decisions. In fact, these lower level decisions are so important, just like our intellectual phases, if I do not have good, well-made upper level decisions, if these are not well-made up here, I'm going to guess at them because the lower level decisions rely on those being made up above. And if they're not clearly well articulated, I'm just going to have to make them up myself because I need them to be able to make these decisions at the bottom. The other thing we can see this too is that if you look at log regulations, they talk about design inputs matching to design outputs. And here I can start saying, hey, if I look at my decisions in these two columns, on a broad brush, not true every case, but on a broad brush, I could say most of my design inputs should be under the problem column, and most of my design outputs should be on the solve, uh, solve column, and uh, the decision scope should match up pretty well. That is a design input at the release, should have a design output at the release as well. And so it helps my traceability if I start seeing this kind of matrix going forward with my gestalt shift from requirements, label everything a requirement, to this idea of decisions that we're making and putting them in a matrix. But what happens when I go out to my clients? Well, what happens when I go out to my clients, I start saying, show me one of your documents, the things that you call requirements. And I start trying to map out what decisions are in there. And if I start plotting those out in my decision matrix, what I notice that a lot of my decisions, well, they're down to the right, right? They're down here, over here in the corner, and it's just, not plug. Everyone's wanting to decide in that particular corner. And this is pretty dangerous because one of the, I think it has lots of dangers down here, but one of the one of the biggest dangers I find is that when I don't know the problem, the problem is not well articulated either at the top or even on the left hand column here. When I don't know the problem, every solution is a valid solution. And this is causing a lot of my medical device clients or other regulated clients to start saying, what should be our feature set? What should be in scope or out of scope? because they're all talking about things they can build, they all have good reasons because we're not clear about what problem we're trying to solve here. And so by mapping in this out, I can start saying, wow, you've, you've, you've articulated a real energy solution. What problem is that actually solving for you? How is that gonna make you sell more units, right? What is this making the world, the, your consumer go, yes, I needed that. And that's why I wanna spend time and money with your solution as opposed to someone else's solution or my own invented homegrown solution. <clears throat> Gestalt shift six builds upon this idea of decisions and how we want to capture those in packaging. And when we talk, when I say that we're packaging, usually we're talking about it, most of my companies building documentation because we need to have some level of evidence, 
some level of documentation that we could present to regulators saying, yes, we followed our practices that we've called out in our quality controls and that the product actually does what we claim it does, right? But what we have basically built typically is what I call a they-based document approach. Um, and uh, the gestalt shift here is going to be how we go from a they base to a decision based document approach. Let me describe this to you. The they based document approach typically looks something like this. We have someone like a consumer and we say to the consumer or customer or something like that, you get a document and we'll call this the customer requirements document or something like that. And then the product manager gets a document and we'll call this the product requirements document, right? So the product manager gets his own document and says, here's where you capture all the things that you want to decide. And then the development team or the technical team gets this and then you can have, well, you get a document and we'll call yours the technical requirements document. And finally, their individual contributor, some subject matter expert gets the document and says, okay, here's your detailed document, whatever you want to call it, feature spec, a detailed design document. You get that thing for whatever you do. And gosh knows, there might be some others, some business requirements documents. So the business gets their document. Overall architecture gets their document, right? All these documents get created because we assign a document to a person or a document to a role. And then we try to do this trick, right? We try to say, Gosh, you know, this one should lead to the PM, said this should lead to this one down the dev, which should then decompose down to the SME. And we try to link these together for our traceability issues and making sure we're all in the same page. And this looks great on paper, except remember what happens when we go analyze what's actually in any one of those types, not just the devs, not just SME, but any one of those documents. You open up and actually map what decisions they're making and we're all back into that corner again, right? We're all down there. Everyone's trying to make the same decisions. Everyone wants to make highly technical, very small decisions. And I think this makes sense in a way because those are things that are real. Problems are abstract. Problems are notional. They're not how we typically think. And if you go to a team full of engineers and problem solvers, they're gonna give you solutions because that's how human beings like to think. And so, yeah, it makes sense that they're thinking here, but th what's this doing to our overall set of controls? All the things we wanna do here. What kind of the issues are we facing? Well, I think we're facing several issues. One is that we're missing whole classes of decisions, very important decisions. Again, when you don't know the problem, every solution looks really, really good. And so, and when we're missing decisions, people are gonna be making them up. And when people are making them up, how likely are they gonna be making up the same? because the decision was never actually made, and we often even don't realize it wasn't made. And good Lord, how does traceability really work here? And I know all of you are struggling with traceability. Everyone's struggling with traceability. Yeah, we got these big expensive tools, but we're all making decisions in the same kind of decisions. Which one traces to which, right? It doesn't make sense anymore. In fact, I could have a product manager or a customer making a low level decision and the dev person taking it back up a notch. Shouldn't their dev persons trace back down to the customers because they're at different levels of scope, right? So traceability becomes really, really, really hard. And we have the wrong people making decisions. This is particularly true because I'd like to tell people, typically your consumers, whether they're being human or machines, are not the best designers. Yet everyone's making these detailed design decisions. It really is role confusion. I've talked to some of my regulated clients and they're just like pulling out their hair saying, why are they making decisions that we're supposed to make? And they wanna get out their RASCI charts in big detail say, no, stop doing that. But the people over there are not sure what decisions they should be making because no one's helping them seeing, hey, here's what's missing. Here's how we need to make these other decisions. And of course, we're doing this at the wrong time. We're forcing decisions too early in the process that should be made much later when we have more information about what's actually going on. And we really need to be making decisions earlier that we're not making at all. We still have those missing decisions. So how does decision-based documentation change? Well, decision-based documentation is gonna say, hmm, maybe we should look at decisions to start mapping them out and say, you know what? This decision looks like it's a problem um, decision up at my product level, or it's a problem decision at my release level, or it's a solution decision, right? We just map out decisions as they're being made. Don't argue them, don't push back on them to say, oh, it looks like you've made one of these decisions. 
right? And if we think this is just too early, we notice that they've made a detailed design decision long before we really need to make that decision, you know, we'll just, we'll capture it, but we'll park it as pending or anticipatory, but basically not lock it down yet because until we get close enough, we don't want to finalize that decision quite yet. And then create documents or evidence that reflects the decisions at the proper scope. And that's what we want our quality control to actually talk about. Say, here's how we're going to capture this stuff. Not they get a document and then they get a document and then they get a document, but here's the decisions we made and here's how we captured all the similar decisions. And so we could trace them correctly to the other decisions that respond to that decision. Um, and then once that's done, then we place it in uh, quality control, and sorry, into change control. We don't want to be changed. So part of the problem with the they document is that they would write it very early and then we put it under change control. And of course, things would change because they were making decisions way down detailed. And then change control process would eat up all our time and effort. But if we wait and say, hey, this decision is actually good. It's right when it's supposed to be made. That's what it's supposed to make it. Then we put it under change control. We're good. And then I want to add to this, we're going to want to add some decision criteria to actually help make sure that is actually done. So what it might look like? Well, one might look like this. This might be a possible solution where you say we're going to have four levels of documentation. We're going to have problem definition, release definition, increment definition, and work item definition. And some regulatory bodies have already even promoted this as a possible way to go. And I like this one personally a lot because it forces both the solution people and the problem people to work together on a common document. I find that if I force them to work together on something common, they actually will talk to each other. If I give them their own documents, again, I start seeing people start doing independently things that may not mesh well together. So I like sort of forcing them together a little bit here. I think that works really well. But it's not the only way you can do it. Remember, this is not a template. It's a framework. So you might come with an answer like this. You might say, you know, I still want to create a product requirements document because my regulations talk about having a product requirements and an SRS or a technical requirements. So maybe I do it like this. So I can have those top level things are the ones that I will give off to regulators and the bottom level things are things I use internally to help me build and support the top level things. But because the decisions are at the right level of scoping and they're in the right column, my traceability starts making a lot more sense here. So. That's what we start thinking about, doing this gestalt shift from they documentation to decision-based documentation. And my final gestalt shift is from speculative to as-built. This is one thing that gets us in trouble a lot is that because we started seeing this overall regulatory framework as a template, we started saying that some things had to be built in front, like our requirements document had to be built in front. And let's face it, if we were honest, most of what we put in those documents are what I call speculative decisions. That is, we think it's going to go this way, but we're not really quite sure because we don't know yet. We haven't actually done the work yet, so we don't know, but we're guessing this is what's going to be. And it's a good guess. It's an educated guess, but it's still a guess. And the gestalt shift is to say, you know what? We really need the documentation when we go to market. Now, we don't want to wait till the day before to build it, but we can build it up over the course of the project. We can switch from speculative to as built. How does this work? Well, again, here's our speculative document and typically it's in a they document format, right? And they have all this documentation here. And of course, we're making decisions often much earlier needed because everyone wants to make detailed design decisions. Um, that information is likely to change as we get more information, which means we're gonna have to invoke lots and lots of overhead as we go through change control, over and over again, because we kept changing that they document we built on speculative documentation. And our traceability, because they're not making right decisions at the same kind of scope in the same column, our traceability is all over the place and it's very, very hard to do. So how do we just solve this? What's the Gestalt shift gonna do for us here? Well, we're gonna slide that over and start saying, we're gonna create something else. We're gonna speculate in what I call working documents. What are working documents? Working documents are temporary documents which you could actually discard when complete. That is, they're there to help you get to the process where it's done. Take something completely working was done. And then when it's done, we'll go over and put it in a long-term repository. But I'm only putting it in this long-term repository to reflect the as-built state. When it's actually done, then I put it in there saying, yep, yeah, that's what we did. I had a working space and I put it in the as-is space. 
And so these two spaces, whoops, gotta make it go forward here, right? I could have a development phase repository, and I wanna make sure that transition goes to a checklist of some kind. Uh, very common in Agile, people will talk about a definition of done. We could use this concept many places, saying, ah, when is a requirement done? When is a technical architectural piece done? Right? What's the checklist of things I have to make sure are true when I'm done? And what's really cool with a checklist kind of approach between my working space and my repository, my development repository, I can actually then use that as the basis for the definition of my quality controls, which is actually looking at the quality of the content rather than just the documents I tend to produce. This is where quality can be an aid to the team. What do we need to know to say this is truly done? How do we help you enforce that so people aren't pushing things into a done state that aren't truly really done? And this is where quality control can be a huge asset to a team rather than just the process police, right? They can help them actually solve these problems going forward. And so as I, if I do this and I do this well, I can start saying all my change of control and revision history can really focus on that thing that is done. And I could just say for the rest of those working documents, yeah, right? If I keep them, fine. If I don't, fine. They're not there because it's only after it passes that done checklist that I start saying, here's what I want to do my change control on and maintain a revision history. So when I go to market and I go to the regulatories, this actually reflects the as-built state of the product. All right, so those are my seven gestalt shifts from going from regulated waterfall to regulated agile. And if we sort of sum up here, uh, it's, I think I like the way I phrase this. I want to think in intellectual batches, the faces rather than waterfall, right? So we've got to make that shift because what we're really doing is going to small batch intellectual phases, right? As we make the shift in the way saying we can shrink the batches so the overlap goes away. And then we can have our quality control because we, we switch it from a switched from a, a template to a framework. We can then define our quality controls around this idea of creating small batches. And then we can then align our teams so they create the working software in these small batches so we can start doing validation or start at least verification, potentially even validation. And then we can start saying to support that, let's make sure about who's making what decision and when to make sure we have the right kinds of decisions being made at the right kind of time. And then we can capture those in decision-based documentation that's built up over the life of the project. So these are seven gestalt shifts that I highly recommend you consider as you're trying to go from regulated waterfall to regular agile. Will there be other gestalt shifts? Potentially, could happen. But these are seven, I think they'll help you take a long way to take the regulatory environment that you have and become more agile in it. And with that, I'm ready for any Q&A. So I call upon Eric and Jesse. You let Eric, looks like you have your mic on. Did we get any questions or did I just stun them with, with that kind of gestalt shift? Yeah, if you back up one slide, your summary makes a good um, spot for this. It, it, the way you describe the decision matrix, Number five here is very crucial because if we don't get that right at the beginning, then all the, all the bets are off because we're building the wrong thing. Have you seen any best practices within this environment for ensuring that we don't end up with stipulated product problem or sorry, problem dis decision making at the top where people believe they're right and it turns out they were wildly wrong once everything is known? So it's decision quality, right? How do you get good quality decisions at number five, not just people saying, I know what the market wants? So so let me sure I'm I'm a this is the Earl stall to make sure I get the question when my brain is hopefully subconscious working on a perfect answer. Um, is it the question is how do we make sure that we made the decision or how to make sure that a decision made that someone's mapped to one of my grid quarters here? So if I go to my the upper left matrix is grid, right? Kind of You're, thing here. Right. Yeah. If I go to my matrix things, if I'm if I'm saying if we made a decision here, is the question is did we make a decision there is one question. And the second question, the decision made there, is that actually a good decision? Is it a good decision? The decision quality. So obviously there's a gap here where people are not making decisions. But one of the first things that could happen if people go to make those decisions is they assert they know what the market wants, make all these problem product decisions, and they're wrong. Right. And then they only find out later at very expensive cost. Right, so um, there are some best practices around those. Um, um, we would have to bring in our, our coworker, Bob Weber, a little bit to help do that because the idea is you want to you want to put those things to a test as quickly as possible. That's the idea. The product managers who's particularly, I mean, to me, particularly these decisions up in this corner right here are bet the business decisions, right? You get those wrong, you're screwed. <laughs> 
you get those right, you could be on the well to be millionaires, billionaires, mm -hmm. um, because they're bet the business decisions. The question is, how quickly can you test that decision whether it's good or not? Right. It's like making it movies, right? I think this will be a blockbuster, or I think this is a dark, but everyone thinks their movie is a good movie when they start. Yeah, is, once, once you see it in IMDb, you end up thinking, who thought that was a good idea? Right, yeah. but you know, you might be want to say, hey, let's take the storyboard to some people and see how they respond to it, rather than investing in making the entire movie, then figure out how they respond to it. Right. So the question is, can you figure out tests for this process uh, before you go for it? And that's what product managers, if you go to pragmatic marketing, um, a different company than ours, but they really focus on training product managers, will teach you how to do that kind of stuff. Yeah, well, I think you made the point earlier, though, that by treating things with intellectual phases and small batches, one thing you didn't say a lot about is risk management, but there's an intrinsic risk management at this level by using the intellectual phases to understand what problem you face and where the rocks are in the road and using those small batches to go off and get quick feedback from the market itself. Yeah, that's, I, 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 I actually sort of avoided the term risk management a little bit because whenever I say risk management to regular companies, they are obviously product risk. Are we going to hurt, yeah. hurt somebody as opposed to project risk or even as you're talking about business risk? Are we even building yeah. the right product? Are we solving the right yeah. problems? Yeah. Okay, second one has come in here. Uh, do you need to drive decisions down to the lowest level? At some point, those decisions have to be made. People are going to write code. People are going to build hardware. Those decisions will be made. Um, one of the really great things, if I go back to my framework again, so my framework, I love my framework. Let's just put this one up, version of it here. If I did a good job sort of here on up, if those are really well done, I can allow people a lot of independence down there saying, go for it, right? As long as you don't violate what's up here, <laughs> I'm good, right? Because this release has to solve these issues, has to do this stuff, has to do it in sort of this way. You go figure out, do it. And I don't have to then detail all that out because the regulatory bodies typically do not want that detail. Um, it just, they can't stomach it either, right? What they really want typically, now every regulatory is different, but typically they want at least the problem definition well-defined and all the tests and all the validation tests you can do at the level because they're all solutions up there too. And maybe at the release level, but underneath that, they really don't want that detail, but you need it internally. But how you manage that, you can get really flexible on it. You can say, teams, you can figure that out as you're going along. It will be defined, those decisions will be made, but you can have a lot more looser structure on that than you do on those top ones. The top ones are where you're going to put a lot of your quality controls on. Mm -hmm. But again, with your with your illustration of the lack of detail put into the problem definition at the product level, you end up, I think, getting a lot of stipulated design decisions, as you called yeah. out. Everybody's down in the lower right hand. And the questioner is asking if we need to drive decision making to the lowest level. We do, but not necessarily by forcing them into one box canyon implementation because that's what we thought of at the top. Right, right. In fact, you're, you're probably going to do yourself a disservice because now you're going to have those timing issues and are your, your best designers making the design decisions. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, one of my favorite phrases from requirements classes was, if the system must be or act a certain way, say so. Otherwise, leave the people downstream as much flexibility to use their training experience as possible. Exactly, exactly. All right, that's all we have in the question thing. So well, I excellent. Excellent. Well, then I thank everyone for attending or, or watching this later on in our on-demand environment. If you have additional questions, you can contact us at contracts at hello at contracts.com or me personally at earl.bd at contracts.com. Um, our, we're going to be doing a lot more live sessions. Uh, you can see a lot of me on the on-demand, uh, a little bit of Eric there. And we're going to hopefully, uh, you can see more of us in these live uh, virtual sessions going forward. So I look forward to running to you again. Everyone have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your day.